Tonight, we have Ryan Chornock. He's an assistant professor in physics and astronomy, and of course, he's going to be talking about black holes, facts, and fiction. Ryan, it's all yours. Okay. All right. Thank you. Here to talk about black holes, in part because it's something that I actually do research on, and in part because it's something with a lot of popular appeal, and you see it a lot in science fiction movies and so forth, and it's only partially true what you see in those movies. So my goal here is to talk about a little bit about what, from a scientist perspective, we know about black holes in the real universe and what they do. And so this is supposed to be interactive, so feel free to stop on questions. I have a plan here, but we can go off on tangents. I just won't have any slides if we go off on a tangent. So what is a black hole? Yes. Ah, so he said a black hole is hard to explain, but sucks stuff in. And so one of my lessons is going to be that black holes don't suck. <laughs> I think I was not allowed to use that as my title. But, <laughs> but yes, that's a common misconception right there, that they're sucking things in. So yes, they have a lot of gravity. But we'll talk a little bit about what that gravity does in just a minute. So what makes a black hole's gravity special compared to that of Earth's? It's higher than the speed of light. Or, phrased, that a gra black hole is an object whose gravity is so strong that nothing, not particles, not light, can escape its gravitational field. So the idea of a black hole, you probably know, has something to do with relativity and Einstein and all that, and we'll get into that in just a bit. But the co basic concept that there could be objects that are so, have such strong gravity that light cannot escape actually predates Einstein by more than 100 years. Well, sort of. So in the late uh, 18th century, two astronomers are now generally cr uh, accredited with taking up the idea about uh, the escape of light from a body. And so at that point, the only thing that was known about gravity was Newton's law of gravity. And Newton's law of gravity says the force of gravity is proportional to the product of the masses of two objects divided by the distance squared. And so two independent astronomers, an English astronomer named John Mitchell, who I don't know much about other than this, and Pierre Laplace in France, who's very famous for many things in physics, independently said, wait a minute, what happens if that radius gets really small? At that point, even in the late uh, 18th century, about 1780 or so, it was already well established that the speed of light had to be finite. And so given a finite speed of, uh, given a finite speed of light, we knew that there was sort of a maximum speed that light could go. And so they combined this with the notion of an escape velocity. So an escape velocity is how hard you have to go in order to leave the gravity of an object. You know, if I throw up my pointer, it will come back down because I'm not throwing it fast enough. If I strap on a sufficiently large rocket, it will go fast enough and will escape Earth's gravity. And so they just took this calculation about the escape velocity and said, what happens if the radius gets really small? It exceeds the speed of light. And if that happens, then a light beam that goes upwards, just like my pointer, if I throw it upwards with my arm, it's going to fall back down. And so they came to that conclusion independently and proposed the idea phrased in various ways, of a dark star, a star whose light cannot escape from the surface. So the reason why I said they sort of got the concept was because there's a flaw there due to Newton's gravity. So I just defined Newton's gravity as saying that the force of gravity is proportional to the product of the masses of the two objects divided by distance squared. Light is massless. Why would gravity act on light? So they got most of the way there to the concept of a black hole, but their conceptual framework was missing a key step. And for that, we have to go to Einstein. So Einstein put together his theory of special and then general relativity in the early 20th century by starting from some very simple postulates. 
very simple assumptions from which everything else flows. And so I'm going to give you a briefest outline of how his assumptions lead to the warping of space and time and the properties that reach their most extreme in a black hole. So his starting point for special relativity was two assumptions. One is that you have no way of knowing if you're in a closed laboratory, whether you're stationary or you're moving at a constant velocity. So if you're in an airplane, the windows are closed, the blacked out, you would not know if you're in motion. So in reality, you know you're in motion because it's bumping around and you're seeing little accelerations. But he said that there's no difference between motion at a constant velocity and being stationary. You can't tell the difference. You can't run a physics experiment to tell the difference. The second assumption is that the speed of light is not only finite, but it's constant for everybody. The speed of light is finite and constant in a vacuum. And those two things mean that our classic notions of space and time are no longer separate anymore. And so to talk about this, I think the simplest example to illustrate how space and time have to necessarily get mixed together, just given these two assumptions, is something called the light clock. So I am going to fire my laser beam, assuming I turn it on, at my hand here. I'm going to perform a physics experiment. And instead of having a continuous laser beam, you can imagine I'm flashing it so that there's individual pulses of light traveling down here. The speed of light is roughly one foot every billionth of a second. So if I'm holding my, feet, my hands apart like this, I see it go from here to there uh, roughly in one billionth of a second. So maybe it's two billionths because I'm holding my hands apart. So I am performing a physics experiment right here, and I say that I can measure the time it takes to go this distance, and I know the speed of light, and, we'll, and you can watch me, and you can say, well, I, you can see how far apart my hands are. We agree the speed of light is constant. We can measure the time that separates these two. All good. But now imagine that I'm running sideways across the stage here. From my perspective, the light is just going straight down from my pointer to my hand. So from my perspective, it's exactly the same as the previous experiment, assuming I'm going at constant velocity, by the first postulate. From your perspective, I, because the speed of light is finite, I release a pulse of light over here, but because I'm moving sideways, I don't receive it until I'm all the way over here. So it's hard to see with real light because it moves so quickly. But from your perspective, you're watching a pulse of light leave my pointer up here and be received down here. And that is much longer than this. And since the speed of light is finite, it takes longer to go that way. And so if we didn't say my pulse of light is a tick of a clock, that means you and I are going to disagree on how rapidly my clock is ticking. And so space and time get mixed up in this way. But this only talks about motion, constant motion. This is why it's called the special theory of relativity, because that's a special case. Einstein's theory of general relativity added an additional postulate, which says, OK, we can't tell the difference between motion that's at a constant velocity and smooth and being stationary. Einstein's general theory of relativity says, let's make that a little bit general and not go at a constant velocity anymore. But now we are experiencing some acceleration, some change in velocity. And so Einstein's insight was that this change in velocity is, is an acceleration, and it is indistinguishable from a gravitational field. So our example here, we have a person on a scale in an elevator. If the elevator is not moving, it reads your normal weight, because that's the force of gravity of Earth on you. If you're falling, it reads lighter. If you're pulled upwards, it'll read heavier. 
because you have an additional acceleration upwards, which is an additional force on you. You perceive that as stronger gravity. So if we then add a complication here, which is my little laser pointer here, if we're inside this elevator and we don't know anything about what's going on, if it's stationary and I fire my laser pointer across the elevator, it's going to go basically horizontally, right? If I'm not moving, I'm not accelerated, nothing's happening, it goes straight across. But once this, once this elevator is being accelerated upwards, in the time that it takes my light beam to go to the opposite side of the elevator, the elevator's moved up. And so it will droop down. It will hit the spot on the wall beneath the horizontal point. That's just because during the time in which it takes the light to travel across your elevator, the elevator has accelerated and moved upwards, and so your horizontal path is curved. And so that means that accelerations can curve the apparent path of a light beam. And if accelerations are indistinguishable from gravity, then this means that gravity can curve the path of a light beam. So this is the briefest of descriptions about how the distortion of space and time can result in objects that now mix space and time such that we don't agree on the same rulers, we don't agree on the same clocks, but the mixture of the two. And so this is the origin of the diagram that's frequently used where you can imagine some sort of heavy ball on a rubber sheet that's stretching the rubber sheet under Earth's gravity. That's not really true because there's an external force here. But it, you can imagine that if you're trying to make a path across this rubber sheet, it's all distorted. And so the paths that objects can take and the paths that light beams can take are now warped. So massive bodies warp and deform space-time. And this affects both you know, particles, physical objects, us, and light. And so if you were to shine a light beam through this uh, warped space and time, the path of the light beam has to follow these warps, and it's bent. And this was uh, one of Einstein's original predictions of general relativity, that if you looked at the positions of stars behind the sun, the positions would be warped because of the gravity of the sun, and so their positions would be changed during a solar eclipse, when you block out the light from the sun, you will see the positions of stars have changed because their paths have been bent. And so Einstein made this prediction and was confirmed in 1919. But I want to say a little bit more about this, that we see this effect not just by the gravity of uh, our sun, but we see this from massive galaxies. So this is a face-on picture of a massive galaxy, much like the one studied by my colleague, Professor Klo, here in our physics department. And you see, if you look at a massive galaxy, you see these stringy features. Those stringy features are actually background galaxies. So here we are. Here's the background galaxy. Here's the galaxy in between. The paths of light, beam going from, light rays going from the background galaxy to us are warped and distorted by the presence of this intervening mass. And so they get strung out. So these are very interesting in their own right, but they're a manifestation of the warpage of space and time at slightly stronger level than the sun does. The same thing holds once you go all the way up to a black hole. And so this is an artistic rendition of two important black holes we'll talk about later where they're in front of a star field and there's sort of all this swirly pattern instead of the uniform star field because the paths of light are being bent by a lot. And we'll talk about how you, what happens when you bend light a lot in just a minute. So, here's a pic still from a science fiction movie of a black hole. This is not the black hole, that's the black hole. This is a planet around the black hole. So this warpage of space and time that we talked about has two effects which come up here. One is this crazy image. This crazy image is occurring because there's something in the plane here and the light paths are being bent 
in all sorts of directions, and they're coming out up here, down there. That actually represents not artistic freedom, that was actually ray traced on a computer using general relativity. But there's another thing that's occurring, which is you have a planet right here. And so in the movie, you may remember if you've seen it, it was a key plot point. One hour on the planet corresponds to seven years seen by a distant observer. And so the question is really, can one hour on the planet equal seven years seen by the distant observer? So you should remember from class last semester. <laughs> So what was the answer? So if the black hole is not spinning, the answer is no. And that's where the other complication is about to come in. So if you're this close to a black hole, space and time are really, really warped. So our rubber diagram from before shows the sort of warpage of space. But it's much harder to visualize the warpage of time because it's a sheet of it's a figure. But imagine that time is being stretched out in the same way that space is, such that time runs slower closer to the black hole. That's true. It turns out there's a limit to how close you can get to a black hole and still be in orbit around it. And if the black hole is not spinning, if you're at the closest possible point to the black hole, this time dilation effect, the stretching of time, is something like 20%. It's not one hour, to one hour to seven years. But if the black hole is spinning, it turns out you can find the appropriately finely tuned parameters such that it works out. But you have to be extremely close to the black hole. Extremely close. So, what another thing that so close, in fact, that what's unrealistic here is how small the black hole would appear from the planet. <laughs> You'd have to be so close, you're like there. But it can work out mathematically. Yes? In that case, would the planet's image be more distorted as well? So the question was, would the planet's image be warped as well? And the answer is yes, that if it's that close, uh, a distant observer, depending on the geometry and the orientation, would see potentially multiple images the sort of stringy images, or various combinations, depending on the alignment. So it matters if it's spinning, just because that allows you to have a stable orbit, like an orbit that can exist for a while, close to the event horizon, close to the actual radius of the black hole. So if you're not spinning, there's a limit that's, uh, I guess, uh, that's two, that's somewhere here. But if it's spinning, you can allow it to get very, very close to the event horizon. And that's what gives you the extra factor that allows you. And it's because the spinning of a mass warps space and time even more than just having a lot of mass. So if we go back to our escape velocity thing, another thing we see is our little astronaut, if you imagine taking a mass and shrinking it and shrinking it down, Eventually, you reach a point where the escape velocity, this velocity that it takes to escape, you know, if I throw this up from the surface of the Earth, 17,000 kilometers per second, uh, you get stretched out a little bit. So let's talk about the reason for this. So if you're falling into a black hole, at each point, Gravity is pulling you towards the center. But if the black hole is sufficiently curved in your vicinity, straight towards the center is sort of different on your left side and your right side. So these arrows here are not parallel. They are pulled inwards. This is an example of what's called tidal gravity, the difference in gravity across an object. It's the relativistic version of the, why we have tides on Earth. There's a difference in gravitational force of the moon across the Earth. And so that means that if you have a physical size and your black hole is pretty small, you're going to get strung out as you approach the black hole, just by gravity. 
However, if the black hole is sufficiently large, then it means that this curvature effect is very small. And so if you were to head straight towards the event horizon black hole, you would just pass over. From your perspective, there would be nothing interesting happening except for, you know, very strong gravity, but from a distant observer's perspective, the warpage of space and time would be so much that if you were trying to send out messages, your messages would take longer and longer to arrive, and then your last message before you cross the event horizon would never make it out. But you would just go straight through from your perspective. You disagree on time. And so you would just go straight through until something happens at the center. Where something happens at the center, we can solve the equations of general relativity and talk about what happens at the center, but the problem is general relativity breaks down at the center, so it's not worth really considering that, in my opinion. <laughs> so another question is how black are black holes? So this is why Stephen Hawking is scientifically famous. So he said nothing can escape from the gravity of a black hole. But Stephen Hawking is famous because he showed that that's not entirely true. And the principle has to do with combining quantum mechanics and general relativity. That if in quantum mechanics, it turns out it free space, a vacuum, is not free space. It's not a complete vacuum. And so there's constantly particles being created in pairs, ant matter and antimatter, annihilating each other, returning to energy to the vacuum. So this is sort of well understood in free space. But if you stick it next to a black hole, you can get into a situation where these particles are being created and annihilating, created and annihilating, but one of them falls over the event horizon of the black hole, and the other doesn't. And so now you suddenly have a particle that's been created out of nothing. Well, that's not true. It didn't come out of nothing. It came out of the black hole. So this is called Hawking radiation the sea of particles that's being emitted slowly by the black hole. And theoretically, if you have a black hole, say in the middle of nowhere, there will be a sea of radiation coming out, even though it's not black. Now, it turns out the effect is incredibly small. If the black hole had a mass of our sun, it would take something like 10 to the 66 years for the black hole to completely evaporate by turning its mass into these particles. But you know, that's 10, one followed by 66 zeros. That's way, way, lo way longer than anything relevant to our lives. But it's at least theoretically possible if you had an extremely small mass black hole for that to occur within the age of the universe. People have looked for this effect and never found it. And so these are some of the basic properties of black holes. But now I'm going to talk about how we actually go about finding them in the real universe. Question? Yeah, so the question is, why are the black holes always shown as a funnel on these diagrams instead of a sphere? And the answer is they are, so if it's not spinning, it is actually spherically symmetric. It's just in these diagrams, you're suppressing one of those dimensions in order to show the warpage. And so it's a limitation of trying to show four-dimensional space-time on a two-dimensional plane. So just like here, the sun is producing a dimple in space and time around it, but the sun is itself spherical and its gravity, well, almost, and its gravity is almost spherical. Yeah, that's a good question because these diagrams can be hard to interpret. So here, I'm gonna start answering the question of how do we actually find black holes? And there's three techniques, with two of which are illustrated on this diagram of one of my favorite black holes, which has a funny name in down the corner. So if the black hole is not emitting light, how do you find it? One technique is to look for its gravitational effect on something in its vicinity. In this case, these are, this is a black hole. This is a star that's next to the black hole. And the star is orbiting the black hole. So if you were to look at that star, 
you would see it going around in a circle, but you wouldn't see the thing that's driving it in a circle. You would infer the presence of gravity there that is causing the star to move around. That's one technique. Second technique is when stuff falls into a black hole, it can heat up. So in this case, the, the tidal gravity again of the black hole is pulling some material off the star. It's falling towards the black hole. And it's heating up through a, a process of viscosity, which is something like friction and it's causing it to slowly spiral inward. So this brings up two of my other favorite fallacies, which commonly appear in science fiction movies. So one is, if you imagine the astronauts appear in their spaceship right here, usually there's a scene where they go, oh, as they're being sucked into the black hole. But black holes aren't sucking you down. It's no different than it having a star with that mass, unless you're right in the vicinity of the black hole. So I'm gonna phrase this another way. If our sun instantly turned into a black hole with exactly the same mass, it would get dark, it would get cold, but we'd still be going on our orbit with a period of one year around the sun. There'd be absolutely no change, we wouldn't be sucked into the sun. All we would feel is the gravity associated with that mass, and it'd be the same mass as the sun. So, so when you see something like this, you see these swirly lines leading to the black hole, it's not because the black hole is a cosmic vacuum cleaner sucking in everything from its vicinity. It's because the tidal gravity, just like our stretched out astronaut on the previous slide, is causing the star to be stretched out. And so some of the stuff on the star, you are not a star, you have you know, structural integrity because there's molecular bonds and stuff going on in you, whereas the star is just a ball of gas. So some of that gas is being pulled off, and that gas is then falling into the black hole, not directly, but because the gas has friction amongst itself, and it glows. And so we can look for that effect. And so this is a census of known black holes in the Milky Way. There's roughly 20 of these systems shown, and what's shown in each case is the star, the black hole, and the disk around it, shown to scale, where up there's the sun, there's Mercury, to scale. So these systems here, like this was the one on the previous slide, they're much closer than Mercury's orbit. Much, much, much closer. So you imagine this, Mercury would be way over there. And the reason is you have to be close enough for the tidal gravity to actually pull some stuff off the star. If the orbit were farther apart, we'd never see that. So there's roughly 20 of these systems known, and we think there's about 100 million black holes in the Milky Way. There's 20 that are known. The reason why that's a very small ratio is because this is an extremely fine-tuned process. You need to be in a binary system with a friend. You need to be at exactly the right orbital distance such that your gravity can pull off some of the material on the star. So this is examples of what are called stellar mass black holes. We'll talk about where they come from towards the end. But the other type of black hole is a lot more massive. So those ones on the previous slide were all about five to 20 times the mass of our sun. It turns out that in the center of our Milky Way, there's another black hole that's four million times the mass of our sun, which is very different from 10 or 20. So what you're looking at here is two decades worth of data uh, taken by Adriana Guez and her uh, group at uh, UCLA, looking at extremely high precision angular resolution at the stars in the center of our galaxy. And what you see, this is infrared data, it's, it's movified, so it doesn't look like real data, but you watch the stars go around and go around, and this one yellow, it's gonna go in a complete orbit. It's gonna go in complete orbit around a spot where there's no star. So if we look at that orbit of a star around a spot with no star, we can use Kepler's laws and determine, given the orbital period and the distance, what is the mass that is, has to be necessary to produce that orbit? 
Just like we can measure the sun's mass by looking at the Earth's motion around the sun or Jupiter's motion around the sun. And the answer is that there's something there that has four million times the mass of our sun. It produces some X-ray light, some radio light, but it's clearly not a normal star. And so this is very strong evidence that there's a four million solar mass black hole at the center of our galaxy. So one question is whether or not other galaxies have a similar thing at its center. And the answer is we think basically every large galaxy has one of these black holes at the center. And these black holes range from millions up to billions of times the mass of our sun. This is a Hubble Space Telescope image of a giant elliptical galaxy called M87. You can see it with a small telescope. It's nice and fuzzy and completely featureless to your eye. But if you look with the Hubble Space Telescope, you see not only is there a center, but there's a little thing coming out here, a little jet. This is actually pretty typical of a lot of lot big galaxies. Here's another one, NGC 3862, which again from the Hubble Space Telescope just looks completely uniform and you're not seeing anything right now. It's just a light source that gets brighter towards the center. But if you zoom in towards the center here, you see that there's a jet coming out of the center. Now we subtracted off the galaxy. And we can see motion in this jet. And we, so if you study the properties of that jet, you can see that it's a jet of material moving at more than 98% the speed of light out of the center of the galaxy. And so if we study the collective motions of the stars in this galaxy, or we uh, look at other properties of the galaxy, we can infer the presence of an extremely compact mass, again, that's billions of solar masses that we don't see. So these galaxies are all too far away to see the motions of the individual stars like we saw for the Milky Way. So evidence like this leads us to believe that uh, the black holes can exist in many central centers of galaxies. So in most cases, we don't know anything about these black holes because they're so distant and it's hard to study. Yes? How do we know it's a black hole and not dark matter or some other exotic stuff that has a similar mass? Yes, that's an excellent question. So the question is, how do we know it's a black hole in many cases? And it, that was actually a very long debate in astronomy because the evidence was not so great to rule out all alternatives. We, kn we knew that it could not be a collection of the densest objects known, which are called neutron stars, because the collection of objects would, over time, collide and merge and do something. It, it is, in astronomers' words, unstable. But if you allow for the existence of dark matter or something, you can come up with more and more exotic uh, uh, explanations. And one of the pieces of evidence that has come in favor of all these other things, being like our Milky Way, is that we can measure some of the motions of the gas very close to a black hole. And so we can see material that is moving, within, uh, moving at a substantial fraction of the speed of light deep within the potential well of a, galaxy, of a black hole uh, that has a few billion solar masses. You can, you can measure the gravitational redshift effect and see that. So, but this is a very long debate and it's an excellent question. We like to extrapolate from the Milky Way, but of course, if you wanted to say, I want proof, we can't give you proof. <laughs> So one thing I like to study is whether or not these things can be detected in galaxies where the black hole is not doing anything interesting. We can't see the stars, the black hole's not doing interesting. And here's an example of one of these. So this is some distant galaxy, and this is what a distant galaxy looks like through a telescope. It's just a smudge of light. And this is, a not, this is here an optical and UV, ultraviolet. At some point, experienced a giant flare. And so on the images on the right, you can see where there was nothing. Now there's a giant ultraviolet source. And through a process of deduction, we think this is an example of a black hole eating a star. So we can learn about the black hole in that galaxy. Give you a movie of what this looks like. We're going to start off a movie. There's the black hole, there's the star, and we're going to have a zoomed in version on the right because you can't really see anything. So this is combining a couple of the things I just talked about. If you get too close to a black hole, you get a little bit spaghettified. I said that if for you, that's not a problem to go over the event horizon of a black hole. But for a bowl of gas, it is a problem. 
because the ball of gas is stripped out more than you are because you have you know, chemical bonds and stuff holding you together, whether the gas just has this gravity. And so in the if a star gets sufficiently close to the uh, black hole, it gets stretched out, stretched out and spaghettified, and it loses its structural integrity. And so when it does that, this star that's now spaghetti gets ripped apart, and some of the material just continues going away from the black hole, but some is now on an orbit that sends it back, and it then forms a disk around the black hole, just like I showed you on the previous image. So this is a simulation, this is not data, but it explains the process that we think we see. And so we can use this to talk about the properties of black holes in galaxies where we can't even see all the individual motions of the stars and we can, can't even see all the evidence that we have used to say that there are black holes in the universe. So, the next thing I wanted to talk about was the third way we find black holes in the universe. And the third way we find black holes in the universe is by detecting their gravity directly. And the way we detect their gravity directly is starting with an image like this. And then, imagine you're warping space and time in the vicinity of a massive object. Now we're going to ask the question, what happens if those objects are now in motion? So the warpage in space and time changes. So if two objects are going around each other in an orbit, you know, the warpage of space and time is different here than it is there, here and there. But that information is limited to travel by the speed of light. And so if you put this all together, you lead to a picture where there are waves of distortions in space and time traveling outwards from these two objects that are now in orbit around each other. And they're waves, they're carrying energy. If you carry energy away from the binary, it causes the orbit to shrink. They start spiraling faster and faster, which causes a greater loss of energy, which causes them to get down and get down closer and closer. And so these gravitational waves have a really strange signature that I'm going to briefly discuss. If there's a gravitational wave coming out of the board here, so it's traveling out of the board towards you, and you imagine a ring of beads around the central point, this ring of beads would experience a distortion that's alternately squishing in one direction, and pulling in the, op the perpendicular direction, and then squishing in that direction and pulling in the other direction. And this is a signature of what gravitational waves do. There's gravitational waves passing through us all the time. But they're way, 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 way too small to ordinarily have any effect on you or anything. But if you have a very sensitive detector, you can detect this. So this is the LIGO interferometer, which has been in the news for the pa past couple of years. So this is the one in Livingston, Louisiana, and there's one in Hanford, Washington. And what you have here are two arms that are perpendicular to each other. And what you're doing is you're shining the light down the two perpendicular arms. And you're going to watch for a motion where the perpendicular arms are doing a motion like this, where one's going down while the purple one, uh, perpendicular one's going out, and vice versa. So your signature of gravitational waves is based on this strange perpendicular motion. And when it does so, the light from, which we'll start from the beginning here, so you send light down two perpendicular arms. Light is a wave, it has peaks and troughs. If everything's stable, the interferometer is set up so that the peaks and troughs of one arm, so we go down to the mirror at the other end, we reflect back, comes with the light from the other end, and the peaks and troughs cancel. It requires extreme fine tuning. But then once the mirrors move a little bit, and so one arm gets a little shorter, one gets a little longer, you go out of phase, and you start not perfectly canceling anymore, you start getting a light signal. And so in 2015, this was detected for the first time. 
And so what's, what you're listening to is the sound of black holes merging in the distant universe. So you, they don't actually create sound waves. However, the gravitational waves have a frequency which is set by the orbital frequency of the black holes going around each other. And it's about 100 hertz, which is within your hearing range. So all they've done is mapped the gravitational wave signal from the gravitational wave frequency to your audio frequency. And you hear it high pitched where they've sp sped it up by a factor of four or something, so it's a bit easier to hear. And so you hear a background of noise. Let's do it from the beginning here. But you hear whoop, whoop, whoop. It's So what's going on is you're hearing gravitational waves because they mapped on the frequency of gravitational waves to your audio. But as the binary gets closer and closer together, the frequency of the orbit goes up and up and up. And so you're hearing the sound go to higher frequency as it prepares for the merger. This is called a chirp. That's the scientific word for it. Because the frequency is constantly changing. And so the interpretation of what that signal is, is that you have two black holes in orbit around each other. And they're producing these ripples in space and time. So there's the distortion, there's the deep uh, funnel thing around each black hole. But as they're radiating away gravitational waves, the orbit has to shrink. That increases the frequency at which they go around each other, which increases the frequency of gravitational waves, which increases the rate at which they're losing energy, which causes them to shrink faster and faster and faster until in the last 100 milliseconds here, we are going to get the merger. So it's slowing down now just because it wants to uh, zoom in on the interesting part in the last few milliseconds where these black holes are now moving at something like three quarters the speed of light before their event horizons touch. Boom you form a new one. And so in the first case, you had a 29 and a uh, 36 solar mass black hole. So total mass, you might expect, is 65 solar masses. 29 plus 36. But the final object that was left behind is only 62 solar masses. And so the difference of what happened to the three solar masses of energy, the three solar masses of mass, is by e equals mc squared, three solar masses of energy, three solar masses of matter, or mass, were converted to energy during this process. And that is a gigantic amount of energy. So during the last fraction of a second when this merger is taking place, the amount of energy and gravitational waves coming out of this source was greater than that of all the light and all the stars and all the galaxies of the visible universe but you didn't notice it. <laughs> so it passed straight through you without you noticing it. So one thing I didn't mention about the LIGO process is that when those arms are moving back and forth, they're moving back and forth by less than a thousandth the diameter of a proton, which is why it's an extremely sensitive measurement. And very, very hard to do. But what we've learned is that uh, LIGO is now seeing 10 of these black holes. This is the population of black holes known in the local, well, here are the purple ones, represent the ones I showed on the previous slide, that are known in the Milky Way because they have a friend and they're accreting. But the ones that LIGO finds are even more massive. And so one of our big frontiers is figure out how those systems formed in the first place compared to these ones which uh, are much less massive. So <laughs> I'm going to slow down and stop here because I am being looked at. Uh, <laughs> but I wanted to walk you through that because those are the three ways that we use to actually find real black holes in the real universe and make a census of where they exist. And so uh, to summarize, every galaxy has a black hole in its center. In the case of Milky Way, the evidence is about as rock solid as you can get, four million solar masses. Other galaxies can have more, up to a few billion solar masses. 
uh, we see about 20 black holes in binary systems around us because we see their effects on the star. But because that's such a fine-tuned process, we think that's the tip of the iceberg of 100 million black holes that exist in our galaxy. There's 100 billion stars in our galaxy right now, so that's a small fraction of the total. But uh, we, we just have to extrapolate from the 20 we know about. And then the last one was using gravity itself to find black holes. And if you do that, we're finding types of black holes that we didn't know existed in our own Milky Way. They're probably in more distant uh, galaxies. So thank you, and time for questions. So the question was, are black holes causing the formation of galaxies, or is it the other way around? And we actually think that uh, the galaxy starts first, and we think that the processes that stellar evolution, that are responsible for generating these small black holes, are what produce the seeds that will grow to become the big black holes. And this is an active area of research because we think that story I just told you is true for the majority of objects but it may not be true in all cases. <laughs> and so the idea is you start off with a cloud of gas in the early universe, you have no stars, no black holes, but you form stars, and some of those stars will form black holes. And in the center of the galaxy, you will collect yeah. things, a black hole, other stars, et cetera, and this black hole that start, first black hole that starts off will grow a lot. And it will lead to runaway growth and eventually become as big as a million solar masses. <laughs> but during this whole process of growth, there's feedback back and forth between the black hole and galaxy. It's actually very interesting, but uh, uh, yeah. Yes. Why don't singular black holes constantly lose mass and energy from gravity waves? So why don't single black holes constantly lose mass and energy from gravity waves? And so the answer is that for gravity waves to be produced, you need changes in time. And so a single black hole just sitting there is not doing anything. So if the black hole uh, is in motion, then it can produce gravity waves. Uh, but the black hole itself does not just radiate uh, gravitational waves. So it can still apply gravity even without the wave. Yeah, so it's still producing this. So it's like uh, in my diagram back here. Just like the sun, the earth, and the diagram, they're sitting here, they're, they're warping space and time, but if there's no earth here and the sun's just sitting there, there's a dimple that's just sitting there. Same thing for a black hole, it's just sitting there. And if the black hole starts in motion around another object, then it can start emitting gravitational waves because that warpage is changing. Directly the size of the black hole is directly proportional to its mass. And so for, some, for the Earth, the size of the black hole would be a radius of one centimeter, or a diameter of about an inch. So what's at our, uh, our galaxy center? How would you characterize the size of that? Okay, so in the, for a one solar mass black hole, the radius of the black hole is three kilometers. And so uh, for a four million solar mass black hole, it would be 12 million kilometers. So uh, that's large by human standards, but small by astronomical standards, which means that it cannot be seen directly, although there is an experiment that should be hopefully coming out with data very, very soon that will try to resolve the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. And it's based on a principle no, using radio telescopes, where if you place radio telescopes across the globe and combine their data, you can get an angular resolution equivalent to a telescope the size of the Earth. And looking at in the radio at the Milky Way's black hole, you can at least theoretically get a resolution that's about the same as the radius of the black hole. And so this telescope called the Event Horizon Telescope, their goal is to image the shadow of the black hole in the radio. So when I showed you, uh, yeah, there, the interstellar black hole here, I said that the light in the vicinity of the black hole is all warped around. And you imagine that instead of a disk, you have something that's maybe feeding it a bit less uh, disky. You're still going to have a shadow of black hole where there is no light coming from. 
and you are going to see a bright edge on one side if it's spinning. And so the goal will be to image that. And they should be coming out sometime very soon with images of the black hole in the Milky Way Center. But their major goal, and so I wanted to, thanks for reminding me because I want to say that, because you will probably see a press release soon claiming, here's the image of a black hole showing the shadow. It may not be the most impressive thing because it's very hard to do, but... <laughs> Question? What, what are we talking about as far as density? You know, as far as uh, nothing like can escape, so it's just gravitational field density. Yeah, so, so what is the density required? Um, I would have to do the mental math <laughs> to, to do it. So, so you're shrinking down this. Is that pretty much all identical, pretty much? N no, the density is not. Proportional to size? So, so the radius is proportional to the mass. And so the mass over radius cubed will go down with a bigger black hole. And that's related to this fact that I said that the, small, the larger the black hole is, the less tidal gravity you feel pulling you down. It's because it's less dense. These are related in ways that are not obvious. So before the Big Bang was all the matter of the universe contained in a Big Bang, uh, contained in a black hole. Um, we don't really know what happened before the, big, uh, before the Big Bang, so we can be speculative. But there are, uh, there are various theories and ways of looking at uh, what happens when a, you have a uh, gravitational singularity. And so let me phrase what I mean by this. Um, imagine that you ran the universe backwards in time. Instead of expanding, the universe is shrinking. Eventually, everything would coalesce. Uh, so if the laws of physics are time reversible, <laughs> that means that things that are going on before the Big Bang happened are very similar to things that are uh, uh, thought to occur in the collapse of former black hole. Uh, it, there are some technical reasons why uh, it's hard to have any confidence in any of the statements we're making. but. Uh, because you're going before the Big Bang, when the laws of physics may not apply. <laughs> but there is some reason to draw an analogy there that it may be a similar process, but it also might not be. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. <laughs> One more. Yeah. So given the ubiquity of black holes in the range, you have galaxies of different sizes and shapes. Is there, do you guys have any predictable ways about where black holes are positioned within different galaxies? Yeah, so the question's about seeing that there's an array of galaxies that all have black holes. Is there any predictability to that? So I'm going to focus on the black holes at the center. Be, and the answer is yes. There's relationships between the mass of the black hole and the properties of the galaxy. And uh, very roughly speaking, for a massive elliptical galaxy, it's around 1% or so of the mass of the galaxy is in the central black hole. So in the case of the Milky Way, it's much less. And it's related to uh, the fact that the black hole is related to the spherical distribution of stars. In our Milky Way, we have a disk. We have a tiny little bulge that's spherical. And so it's a fraction of the mass of that tiny little bulge and not the whole thing. But yes, and this is part of the evidence that we use to relate how the black hole had to grow with the properties of the galaxy. Sure. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, I can't see you. Oh. Yeah, let's take it first. This one is not the last part. Are gravitational waves just like distortions of space and time, or do they have like physical like quantum particles? Ah, so we think that if there is a quantum theory of gravity, so the question was, are gravitational waves just distortions of space and time, or is there a connection with any particle? So we don't have a quantum theory of gravity. Almost everybody expects that there is some sort of quantum theory of gravity, in which case there would be something called the graviton, which behaves in certain ways, and we're exciting that field. So there's a relationship, so in the same way that in, we have light, which is an electromagnetic field that surrounds us, but in quantum mechanics, we can think about it as being composed of a bunch of different photons. We think the gravitational field will be the same way, that there will be exchanges of gravitons instead of warp resistance space and time. But we don't have a quantum theory of gravity, so we can't make any predictions about how that's going to go. No.
Yeah, so, oops. So your question is about the sound associated with the black holes. So, so in the LIGO interferometers in Louisiana and Washington, the, 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 the signal you actually measure is an amount of light at this detector, which is coming into view on the right over there. And so what you actually measure is the intensity of that light signal. You then have to take that and invert it and say, to say, this is what the frequency of gravitational waves had to be. Because you look at uh, the, 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 the time history of the intensity that you get, and you convert that into a gravitational wave signal, which then is made in, by direct analogy of the frequency of the gravitational waves into the frequency of sound. So, so uh, uh, there I are a few levels of indirection there, <laughs> if, if I think uh, that's what you were asking. Yeah. Last question. George, close it down. Uh, uh, you mentioned earlier that black holes over a really long period of time lose mass because of Hawking radiation. Is it possible uh, that they lose enough mass to suddenly not be a black hole anymore? Yeah, so the question was, if black holes theoretically have Hawking radiation, can they lose enough mass to not exist anymore? And so theoretically, yes. And in the case of our sun, like I said, there's something, this couple solar masses, that'll never happen in the observable universe. But it's an interesting question for potentially smaller black holes. And so you would expect there to be observable signatures of this happening. So we don't think that the stellar evolution can produce sufficiently small black holes to have any relevant Hawking radiation. But for a while, it was fashionable to speculate that in the Big Bang, tiny little black holes were created, called primordial black holes, and those could potentially have had sufficiently small mass that the Hawking radiation would cause them to evaporate within the age of the universe. So the, what you would expect to see is essentially a burst of gamma rays associated with that evaporation process. Because when it's evaporating, it's creating all sorts of particles, neutrinos, electrons, photons. And the photons it would produce would be gamma rays. And so people have looked for that and not seen it, <laughs> and so ruled out the existence of these sufficiently small primordial black holes at some, you know, you can never say they don't exist. You can't prove they don't exist. You can only set some limit on how common they could be. And basically it turns out they can't be common enough to be interesting by an astronomer's point of view. Yeah. Interesting place to stop. Yes, thank you. <laughs>